this tutorial is a look at the uh, political society and culture of the United Kingdom. And I'm going to start right in the collectivist consensus of the post-war era. So uh, World War II, uh, Winston Churchill and opposition parties suspended normal politics. And during this uh, period of a crisis, uh, there was this establishment of a commission to overhaul the social services system. And some people argue that this started the golden era of British politics from post-war until the mid-1970s. Uh, you would find that the two uh, parties, they uh, had uh, a fundamental understanding over several policy goals. So full employment, provision of social services, cooperation with labor unions, and securing economic growth. So this was really the, the welfare state, the expansion of the welfare state. And effectively, it's, it's, this is why it's called the collectivist consensus, because it was built on collectivist principles and it was a consensus. So uh, even though the two parties had uh, divisions along class lines, uh, they uh, would not fundamentally shift politics regardless of who won the election. So uh, that meant that, that the political cleavages after the war were more along class basis than along actual policy differences. And, and uh, so materialist politics remain, the British remain divided along these class lines, but regardless of uh, Labour or Tory won the elections, there was a, a consistency in terms of which politics were actually delivered. And this during this time, uh, there was a high level of legitimacy for the political system, a great uh, civic tolerance, and, and some would even say patriotic enthusiasm at this uh, time. However, the 1970s says, sees a break in this, uh, and we can we can uh, ask if this is a time that moved towards an uncivic culture. You had growing unrest, the troubles in Northern Ireland, Bloody Sunday, 1972. You had stri strike waves. You had the radicalization of unions during the time of stagflation. Economic growth was was not coming. Inflation was uh, a major problem. And this was the context in which uh, Margaret Thatcher was elected. And uh, of course, she had very confrontational policies, uh, very much targeting the labor unions. And the result became a quite polarized political system, not at all the consensus of, of the post-war uh, era. And uh, for many frustration with the new uh, confrontational uh, politics. Looking at how uh, Britons have organized themselves into civil society and, and uh, community groups and so on, during the post-war, the collectivist consensus, uh, it was a fairly corporatist arrangement. Uh, so you'd have strong labor unions, you'd have the Confederation of British Industry uh, with, with conservatives, the unions with labor, and so uh, that was the, the network structure, which, which would be quite different from the type of pluralist networks you would have seen uh, classically in, in the US at the time. Uh, now, I'm not going to say that um, the United Kingdom was ever as corporatist as some other um, uh, societies have been organized. I'm thinking maybe Germany, maybe Japan, and so on. But if we compare uh, the United Kingdom uh, pre-Thatcher with post-Thatcher, I think an argument can be made that there was more uh, corporatist arrangements uh, in, in the pre-Thatcher years than we would say, see after Thatcher. And this, of course, has to do with how she confronted union power. You can't have a tripartite uh, arrangement if, if one party has been effectively um, challenged and and lost a great deal of power. So I think uh, an argument can be made that uh, post-Thatcher uh, United Kingdom is more uh, pluralist than it was during the post-war years. Uh, and this isn't even a very uncommon situation uh, for Anglo-Saxon countries. They're, they're, they are very often associated with the pluralist network structures. And uh, another interesting part here is how interest groups um, do not so much um, they do uh, maintain a relationship with members of House and Commons, that kind of something that they have to do. Uh, but uh, 
the main focus for their work is not really persuading members of House of Commons to see their way, the way you would see lobbyists and, and uh, advocacy groups in the United States approach uh, people in Congress. Rather, uh, you will have these interest groups uh, consult more directly with government and government departments and civil servants in high positions. And this is, of course, because of the parliamentary system. Since the important decisions are being made either by civil servants that, that provide their expertise, their technical expertise to the ministers, or by the cabinet, and then uh, the majority of uh, the House of Commons will vote according to party lines, then as an interest group, it's more effective to spend your time together with civil servants, the, the civil servants that have the ear of the cabinet. Today, of course, contemporary United Kingdom, it's no longer an empire the way it used to be 100 years ago. And uh, post uh, World War II, the economic standing of the United Kingdom declined quite dramatically. There was a recovery in the 1980s after some years into Thatcher's tenure and the legitimacy for the regime did hold. There is still a welfare state. So uh, for instance, the National Health Service, uh, there is still public health. So even if Thatcher privatized a whole lot of crown corporations, uh, there are still there is still a greater role for the, the uh, state in the United Kingdom in society than, uh, for instance, the American state. There has also been a great deal of political rep repositioning, of course, um, because of, again, Thatcher. I can't really underestimate the importance of, of Thatcher to politics in the United Kingdom, because uh, it's it really redefined and, re and repositioned political life. Uh, and after Thatcher had repositioned the Conservatives, Blair re and the New Labour uh, Party redefined the left. Uh, and the New Labour then was was an uh, attempt to say that we are not like the Labour Party of the 1960s. Uh, we're no longer looking for the collectivist consensus. We're not going to go uh, with orthodox socialism. We're going to uh, take the best parts of socialism with the best parts of the market economy and create a new, more social market economy than the one Thatcher proposed uh, to to uh, have for for Great Britain and that's why it was called new labor because it wanted to distance itself from from what um, the old labor did effectively and, and of course Blair was tremendously successful w with the redefining the left if by success you mean uh, win lots of votes because he did and uh, he brought Labour back to power after being outside of power since Thatcher had taken over. So since 1997, you had uh, Labour in power in Britain all the way up until 2010. And now Cameron and Clegg are in power. And this is Cameron from the Tories and, and Clegg from the Liberal Democrats. This is the first coalition government that the United Kingdom has had since the 1930s. So uh, having a coalition government is quite uncommon for this political system. And this is, of course, because of the electoral system that tends to produce stable majorities. Not so in the last election. Cameron did not get a majority of seats for his conservatives and had to seek out a coalition part partner if he wanted to be in office. And this succeeded. And his current policy initiative with uh, the Great Society has mean, meant a great deal of austerity programs, cut programs, reduced debts and deficits, and uh, effectively uh, trying to, to mobilize civil society to, to do, do things that the government has done before. And uh, we'll have to revisit the consequences of gov Cameron's uh, government program in future years. So uh, here's another interesting question for you. Will there always be a Britain? There has been a re realignment of, of uh, identification within the uh, uh, political culture of the United Kingdom. Uh, identification with Britain as a whole has declined among Scots and Welsh and of course right now 
Scotland is gearing up to a referendum. Will it secede from the United Kingdom? Will it seek independence or not? Uh, this is uh, something that's in the works. Of course, we can talk also about uh, the loss of, of uh, the prestige and influence of the monarchy. Uh, this might have changed with the recent wedding uh, and, of course, the um, uh, continuation of the uh, line of the royal house. Uh, so we'll see what happens when this these uh, newer generations um, of, of royalty uh, take the stage more and more. Certainly uh, the um, uh, diamond jubilee of the Queen and the royal wedding uh, of the last couple of years have seem to have reinvigorated at least some pomp and circumstance around the monarchy in, in Great Britain. Uh, even so, uh, the, the monarchy, uh, in terms of real power and political power, of course, uh, power has, has really diminished quite a bit uh, over uh, the past 50 years. Also, the United Kingdom is, is uh, changing demographically, much like just about any other entrenched democracy. Uh, and uh, some people don't like that very much. Uh, you'll have a party like the UK Independence Party that wants to effectively close the borders to immigration, or uh, the British Nationalist Party that is effectively a racist party that, that uh, wants to uh, keep racially white uh, in Britain. Uh, so all these tensions together, trends together, means that uh, the British national identity is being reframed. Uh, so that's something that uh, a unitary state like the United Kingdom has to uh, manage within the framework of what is acceptable in a democracy. That was a summary of uh, political society and culture in the United Kingdom at present. I hope uh, it was useful.